One thing I've found over this past year with this podcast and as we've taken the initiative of Stand Firm towards families is that when we talk about giving our kids a faith that lasts, even that foundation part of just giving them a faith is perceived differently across Christianity and with Christian parents. We may use the phrase raising our children up in the Lord, but there's a spectrum in what that might look like. I think it's helpful if we use the term that Jesus told his followers. In the Great Commission, Matthew 28, he tells his followers, the immediate disciples then, us today, to go and make disciples. That's what we're doing with our kids. And I believe with that term, it helps us define it more universally. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I promise you, discipleship is not as hard as we seem to make it. Our children are leaving the faith in droves. As a result. Oh, I got got a pause here. We're going live right now. How can we raise our kids to stand firm, have a faith that lasts, and navigate such a time as this? Capital has just been Determination. You have to take the next generation. Today in the news, COVID 19 numbers. I'm Jake McCandless, and this is my podcast, Stand Firm Parents. We're working together to help our children have a faith that lasts. And now, here's Jake McCandless. Welcome back to Stand Firm Parents. I'm Jake McCandless, and whether you've been with us the whole time, or this is your first episode, join us. Join us on the journey as we're helping one another help our children have a faith that lasts. And when we talk about having a faith that lasts, we're talking about a faith that is deeply rooted and fruitful long after our kids leave our house. And as I touched on in the teaser, when we talk about giving our children a faith that lasts, that assumes that we're going to give them a foundation of faith to begin with. And when you begin talking about that with Christian parents around the world, man, there's a difference in, in what we view that to be. In the teaser, I use the term disciple, and I believe if we can look at that term, it begins to help us understand, maybe more universally, it helps us define what our role is as Christian parents. Of course, that's going back to the Great Commission, not just the Great Commission. We see this throughout the rest of the New Testament, but Jesus says to go and make disciples. That's our God-given mission, period. So as parents, we should be doing the same with our children. The first time I ever heard the term talking about you know parenting in terms of discipleship was a joke. A pastor friend of mine who had several kids was joking, and he said, hey, we're doing our part to make disciples. You know, he he was just making a joke. But it was this aha moment for me. It's like, yeah, (laughs) yeah, we're, we're called to make disciples of the world, but it's just start in our home. I mean, if you go back to Acts 1 8, it talks about Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Of course, this is the same time he's given the Great Commission, so I believe we can see these as tied together. Our Jerusalem's our home, starting in our home with our kids. But when you talk about discipleship, I don't know about you, but I've seen it freak a lot of people out. It's freaked me out. It can seem intimidating. It can seem difficult. But it's not as difficult as we make it. In the previous episode, we looked at the difference between Noah's family being saved out of the flood and Lot's family being saved out of Sodom. And it's different. Noah's family willingly walks into the ark. Lot's family has to be drug out of there. And we talked about Noah compelling his family. I believe through his example, through the life that he lived, exposing his family to his faith that compelling, that's, that's discipleship. But to talk about and better define discipleship, I've invited some friends in who I believe simplify discipling our kids. 
My friends were the very first guest that I had on Stand Firm Parents, going all the way back to the very first episode. They're great friends of mine, Daphne Kirk and Andrew Kirk of the ministry Generation to Generation, which aims at reconnecting the generations and preparing them for such a time as this. Their goal is to see one generation discipling the next and preparing them literally for such a time as this. Daphne has brought her son, Andrew, daughter, Daniela, along with this ministry, generation to generation. They're from the UK. They're not there right now, but they're joining us still from far away. Yeah, we're currently in Israel. Uh, we, we brought a group here in February to do a solidarity and serve trip to go and visit places of the massacre of October 7th and hear from experts and survivors and to serve. And so we're doing some follow up on this trip right now, meeting with people that shared with the group and continuing to build other relationships and to be here to comfort God's people, as he tells us to do. But And Jake, of course, is on that last Jake trip. Jake was on that last trip with us. Yeah. yeah. So we're in Jerusalem. And as Andrew said, we are literally on a mission to comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. And before we were starting, I mean, like I said, I, I got the chance to be with you guys in, in February. Uh, mm-hmm. But I mean, I would say it's likely ramped up and what's the, the feeling and the sentiment there. I mean, what is the overall mood there in Israel right now? Um, heartbroken. Absolutely yeah. heartbroken and traumatized. We heard someone speaking the other day about the situation, and, and uh, he's a rabbi here. And he I think he may have been a member of the Knesset. And he said, on October 7th, it took the wind out of us. We lost our breath. Mm. And he said, us being here has put the breath back in his lungs again. And he, and he felt like he's had a hug. And it's just a desperate need, Jake, for people to come out here with us and be here. But you cannot comfort his people from America, from wherever they're listening. It's not what they need at the minute. They need face-to-face with people saying, I've come because we support you and we're here to let you know you're not alone. And we could do a whole program on the stories that we've heard from people, but we won't take that out now. But we are speaking from a place of broken hearts, really. Well, we're going to do a whole program on that, but it still won't be long enough to capture what we need to. And I, I, I can just say, as you're watching this, I know this is going to grab your heart, hearing what they're doing in Israel in such a time as this and as Daphne, as you said, it, may, it it is a huge impact being on the ground. When I went with you guys in February, had no idea what to expect, you know, after these attacks. Because with you, you guys, I saw in July uh, with my whole family, and you know that was before the attacks. But just being there, just being present, just shopping, just giving hugs, just listening is a huge impact. And so we're definitely going to talk about that in a later episode. But I want to talk about discipleship a bit. And it's because, Daphne, you told me an analogy that you gave about discipleship that I think is the greatest out there. And I think discipleship can be intimidating when you use that word. And uh, maybe even as parents, we don't even think about our role is as disciple maker, makers with our kids. And uh, But you have the greatest analogy. So I want you to share that picture. But Maybe first, if you guys can just talk about that role as parents being the disciple makers in the home. Well, I I think bottom line, we're all disciple making, whether we um, think about it or not. We can be disciple making in our neglect of our children and they grow up dysfunctional because of it. We can be disciple making by the way that we... um, let them watch things they shouldn't be watching, etc. We can be disciple making by the hugs we give them. I think people think they choose to disciple their children or not. The fact is, you will disciple your children. You've just got to make a choice about what you're going to disciple them for. And uh, yeah. Okay, that that analogy. Can you tell us the story that you told me uh, of yeah. what you shared? Because I mean, like you just said, we're always discipling. I don't think we realized that, uh, but you summed it up on how we can do it well. Yeah. So we were in Brazil and I've been asked to speak on a section in our conference called Discipling Your Children. So before we started and, and we got, I don't know how many pastors. Yeah. Multiple thousands. Yeah. yeah. 
So I said to them, okay, before we start, how many of you like football? Now, before you get carried away with this football thing, I mean British football, because if you're American, you do not play football. You play hand egg. We play football. Okay, so we're talking football. Yeah, I, I think we uh, I think we have this discussion every time we do an interview. <laughs> I, as I shared, sure. you guys were our first guest with this podcast, and now you're the first guest in the new studio and the new platform. Uh, and then we've got to go down this this rabbit hole again. But okay, you know it's your version of football. It's, I'm good not to, sure. it's good to lay the foundation. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure you've got it, Jake. But I think this time you know you've got it, so we won't bring it up again. Anyway, so all these pastors, they were putting their hand up. Yeah, they love football. And Brazil loves football. So um, anyway, then I said to you, how many have children who love football? And they're all shouting and yes, and the hands are up and standing up. Then I said, how many of you have children who support the same football team as you? And again, they're all shouting out football teams. And because Andrew was there, I shouted out Manchester United and uh, the place was in sort of organized chaos. So when it calmed down, I said to them, all right, now, why have you asked me to talk about discipling your children? Because you all know how to do it. You did it with football. And the place went very, very quiet. Now, I then said to them, well, how did you do it with football? You didn't go to a class. You didn't need a book. You didn't need anybody to tell you how to do it. How did you do it? You love football with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, which is passion. And when you're passionate about something, you talk about it when you walk along the road. You'll have the posters on the wall. You'll have the hats on, the T-shirts on. And so you live out Deuteronomy get with whatever you're passionate about it. But you're told in scripture to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, which is passion. And you'll talk about him when you get up or when you walk along the road. So the end of that little example to me is you will disciple your children what you're passionate about. And I have never met a parent who's passionately in love with Jesus who is not discipling their children. And I just love to see you and your children the way that your passion for Jesus is flowing over them. That, that analogy, just just incredible. I mean, I, I had the chance to be in Brazil uh, for a mission trip. Every, you know, here in the States, when you see, you know, a playground or something like that, you're going to see basketball goals. Everywhere you went, there was a soccer goal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was all those yellow and green jerseys everywhere you went. I mean, I, we left with some because it impacted us. You know, we follow uh, Brazil's football uh, soccer as as well now after being there. And so I can just see that picture of those people just going going crazy. And I'm sure they're fans of teams and individuals that their parents are. Great example. But it can be intimidating, but I think you just broke down those barriers. You you gave us some advice towards that, but can you give us some practical ways in which we can pass on uh, that passion? Well, I think telling our own personal story is one way. Um, I mean, the Bible says, write it on your heart and tell it to your children. So the first thing is we are going to pass on what is on our heart, not in our head. So I think on a very practical way, it's the way we go about it. You don't go to your child and say, now, come on, get dressed. It's time to go to football. Hurry up. We're going. We're going to be late. It's more like, hey, come on, let's go. It's football. And, and just those simple ways, the way that we approach it makes all the difference. And yet I see parents treating um, the things of God as second rate and, and a chore. Um, and I think children receive it that way. And now I'm going to skip this next example, knowing I could be treading on the toes of many people listening, but I'm going to do it anyway, because I have personal experience of this and I have walked it out. If we don't prioritize the things of God, then they're going to be secondary. So here's two examples. Parents say, well, I can't force them to go to church. And I say, well, that's okay. 
then don't force them to go to school. Don't force them to do their homework. <laughs> don't force them to get out of bed. Don't force them to do those things. Yeah. Since when did following Jesus come secondary? We don't say, oh, if I force them to go to school, they might resent it when they're older. And so we give the message, yes, going to school, etc., is important. But no, you can choose about the things of God. We have this twisted sort of mindset. One thing that I do see takes the place over and over is sport. Now, I say, I am talking from personal experience. I actually um, was chosen for the Olympics and my parents said no because I go out doing sport on a Sunday. Well, well, well hold up. <laughs> hold up here. Okay, Olympics, <laughs> you, you can't just drop that. I mean, I haven't heard this before. <laughs> I've known you guys for several years. Uh, in, in, in what sport was this? You, see, you told me I told the football one over and over, so I had to go in breaking new ground. <laughs> it was athletics. It was hurdles. Okay, cool. I didn't see that one coming. Very cool. Just why she, we know why she's so good at jumping over hurdles these days. <laughs> <laughs> Obstacles are no challenge. Okay, so I interrupted you. You're talking about uh, sports be getting in the way often or maybe – prioritized over the Lord. Yes. So they said, you're, you're not doing it because you'll be there. You won't be in church. You won't be prioritizing. This is God's day, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Jake, I have zero memory of any resentment whatsoever about that. And you know why? Because I saw my parents' love for Jesus oh. and I knew it came out of a heart of, one, of loving him and wanting me to love him too. And I just didn't resent it. And yet I see over and over how sport and sometimes education takes priority over the things of God. And so children grow up, well, sport's more important than being with God's people, even though the Bible says, do not neglect the meeting together. But we don't neglect the meeting together on the football field, but we'll meet, neglect the meeting together of God's people. So I've given a couple of examples of just checking our priorities or we give our children mixed message. Dovetails great with what we started with our first episode uh, because I had the opportunity to join a team and they, they brought me in to speak at, at conferences on preparing the, the next generation, preparing our kids for the end of the age. And one of the things in looking at that was comparing Noah's family, their, them making it through that apocalyptic judgment, and Lot's family. Noah's family willingly walked onto the ark, all of them, while Lot's family had to be drug uh, there. And so the heart is, and what you just described is, is we are to compel our kids with our passion, with our kids. That I mean, that's what you talked about it smoothing over with you, but... You still, while they're in your care, you're still to drag them too. <laughs> you know, it's still to take them there uh, to to church. I mean, and not have that fear of resentment. I've heard many people give testimonies, and they said when I was a kid, I had a drug problem. Uh, my parents drug me to church, uh, but you know, and so I think ultimately what you're saying is the passion is ultimately what produces discipleship. But at the same time, we shouldn't be afraid to lead out in, in that way well you think i remember i said that i didn't resent it because i knew my parents love for jesus and so that was authentic of them to ask that of me yeah. and it just made total sense we can't live one thing and then expect our children to live another i mean that causes resentment neither can we live it in a resentful way and moan and groan and and complain about things that we should never should in front of the children and expect our children not to resent it. So our role modeling is vital. You know, all of us continue to live out things that we saw our parents do, yeah. even when we're adults, because we take it in without even thinking about it. Yeah. It's role model before us. And so what we role model is the context of which everything else will happen. And I don't think we role model because we want to disciple our children. We we do it out of a love for Jesus, and that's what we want from our children. I just want to say this, the time is up for playing games. 
the, the days are serious, the days ahead are serious. We're going to have to make hard choices. Our children are going to have to make hard choices. And it's time we started walking into these with our children so that when they are not with us, it, it's a part of their lifestyle to make those hard choices. I think that the, the times for playing games ended a number of years ago. And we can see when a generation catches a passion mm. and uh, a a something or a topic an issue to run with what that can look like when we look at the college campuses across the us right now um and so we we have to be bringing that passion to the next generation and giving them something to live and die for when it comes to their faith and not just making it a nice fluffy um issue or topic that we talk about from time to time yeah, I don't know how we're doing for time, Jake, but I'll throw this one in. You don't parent, we don't parent our children to be successful in this earth. That's not our goal. And I hate people, oh, I want them to, um, to get to heaven. Well, that's a whole other debate, what we're talking about in that. We need to parent our children so that one million years from now, they're going to say thank you. That's what's important. One million years from now, are they going to look at you and say, thanks, mom and dad, I am successful for eternity. Okay, I know the clip I'm pulling out. That's at the, uh, well, I'm not sure what time, Mark, but I want to make sure I get that. Yes, that's, that's, that is the goal, long-term faith. But I love how you keep taking us back to this, this passion aspect. As we close out, I look forward to talking about just Israel specifically, but how does Israel fit in with discipling this next generation? Put it this way. I had certain goals with all my children from the moment they drew their first breath and probably before. And uh, one of my high priorities was that all my children would go to Israel before they reached 18. Why 18? Because after that, if they decided not to go, I had no jurisdiction. So it was a very practical way. And they all went. And did I have the money? No. If our children don't have an understanding of Israel, it has multiple, multiple, multiple consequences. One, understanding the word of God. Um, they just don't get it in the way that they do when they come here. They walk it out experientially. They see the place where Jesus is going to return to rule and reign. So his return becomes a reality and they're part of the generation could see his return. And then we can see this even as we speak with the rise of anti-Semitism worldwide. I do not want my children standing before the throne of God, having to explain to him why they did not stand before his people because they we will be asked how we stood by his people and this is part of parenting for eternity so i would say to every parent listening bring your children do it one way or another some families one brings one and the next year another brings another or they do it but spend more money on bringing them to israel than you do on getting football kit because it is absolutely foundationally important, not just for their ongoing discipleship, but for the days we're living in and for eternity. I echo that 100%. I can't tell you the impact that Trip and July has had on, had on my kids, but it's totally changed our kids' lives. So I look forward to when we talk about just what you're doing in Israel here in a few episodes. Thank you for making discipleship, not a scary thing, something that we're already doing. We just need to shape where we're doing that. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, thank you. I love the mission behind Generation to Generation. I encourage you to check them out. You can learn more at g2gmandate.org. That's g2gmandate.org. What they're doing in Israel is incredible. And in the next episode, I want to dive into this subject while we're there and talk about how important this conflict involving Israel, regardless of, of your view on it, just how impactful this is to our children's faith and especially the long haul of their faith. So please check out this episode 
It's no small thing. So I'll be talking about the conflict in the next episode, and then we'll be airing the interview with the Kirks about their time in Israel. I hope you checked out those episodes. I hope you subscribe wherever you're watching. I hope that you share. But more than anything, I hope you begin to take steps towards discipling your kids. Be a disciple maker in your home. And I believe that begins with, we have the three E strategy you'll hear over and over again, but that begins with us exposing our family to our faith and the beauty of it. You've been listening to Stand Firm Parents. Stand Firm Parents is a production of Stand Firm Ministries in partnership with LifeWord Studios, created by Jake McCandless and Brandon Harrington of Dime Collective. Again, thank you for listening and be sure to subscribe, share, and most importantly, stand firm.